The Olden World, written by Tsar Yoshi. Chapter 857 A Sky Shattering Dawn. Let me go! Stella tried again to assault the screen she was trapped inside to no avail. Chrysalis! Chrysalis was already leaving. A hoof settled on Starlight's shoulder, and she turned to see Valet wink. Starlight frowned. What? Nah, let her go. She's all hot air. Valet kicked back and laid down. Trust me. How do you know, Starlight pressed. She was talking about trapping me here while she tried to take my body. Valet glanced out at the pedestal. Last I checked, she just turned out to dust. Listen, I couldn't follow 90% of what she was talking about, but I can tell the difference between someone who knows how something works and someone who has a vague idea of how it works and really wants to be right. Sounded to me like she was just trying to get your goat. So chillax. It'll be a lot better in here now that I'm not stuck forever watching the world go by. She's right, Lynn called quietly, crawling out from behind a screen after Chrysalis had wandered away. I can tell when ponies are lying. Valet and Starlight both perked. Really? Valet squinted at her. Yes, Lynn called up, still rubbing her head like she had the beginning of a migraine. She wasn't telling deliberate falsehoods, but she was guessing about things she wasn't sure of. She was probably trying to make you furious. Starlight pressed her ears back. Well, it worked. We need to find a way out of here. Easy, Valet shrugged. All we gotta do is wait. What? Starlight took a step back, too frightened and upset to properly rejoice at finding Valet. What do you mean? It's me, Valet shrugged. I just asked this machine thing. Yo, thingamajig! How long until I can ditch this place? Please be patient, the nightmare module voice urged. Your voyage will be completed soon. Voyage? Starlight blinked and tilted her head. What? Does it think we're still in a meteor traveling for space? Valet looked blankly at her. Bah? Hey, Starlight shouted, willing the voice to respond. We're already right where we want to be. Let us out. Back to the real world. Let us go. Nah, Valet put a hoof on Starlight's shoulder, pulling her back. It gets huffy if you spend too long bossing it around. Try this. Hey, machine, show me that place you showed me before. Initiating physical plane view, Starlight's nightmare module voice said, seemingly heard by Valet as well, but not Len. A part of her view disappeared, replaced by a blindingly bright window into... Maple! Starlight jumped toward a portal, failing again to reach the abstract visualization. But it was there, in her vision. A window out to the engine room of the immortal dream, its viewpoint coming from what she knew to be her obsidian sword. It swiveled at her command, focusing on a bed with a familiar mare. Yep, Valet sidled up beside her. Like I said... Watching the world go by. Speaking of which, want to tell me who you are? Because I'm used to seeing you in there, and now you're somehow in here. Maybe you can explain some stuff to me. Stella just stared, a hoof reaching desperately for a window she couldn't touch. That's the real world. How long have you been able to see it? Do you recognize anyone? The lay scratched an ear. I don't know. You guys all look kind of familiar now that I've been watching for a while, but... Yeah, it showed me this after I made a big enough fuss about being bored the first time. Better entertainment than staring at an empty room all day, let me tell you. Oh, she turned to face Starlet again. So seriously, who are you? Because I've been watching and listening, and it's seriously hard to figure you out. Starlet took a deep breath. We're stuck inside a thing called Moonglass, and I have no idea how it works, but that's the real world, and I want to get all of us out there and back home. You don't remember us, but me and everyone out there are your best friends. Do you believe me? Valet shrugged. Well, it would explain why everyone there knows my name, I guess. Hey, machine, turn up the volume. Gerardo entered the engine room in a huff, looking slightly bedraggled. Gerardo, Maple asked, looking up. Not to worry you, Gerardo began. But have you any knowledge on the whereabouts of that sword Starlet let me borrow in Ironridge, the black one? We may have found ourselves in a slightly dangerous situation, and as long as the equestrian guards are on our side, I'd like to arm them as well as possible. Maple's eyes widened. What's going on? Merely precautionary actions, Gerardo assured, holding up a talon with certainty. 
As I said, not to fret. The ship deck was a different story. Divisions 1 through 3, the acting Pegasus captain instructed, create a diversion and attempt to draw the beasts off to the east. According to intel, they track by hearing and smell. 4 through 7, remain here and defend this airship. 8 through 10, we hide and mount an ambush on the smaller group if they split. We have numbers, but they have strength. We have to whittle them down before we can afford meeting them head on. And what about us, Shenpuck asked, a stiff sea wind ruffling our mane and blowing in from the water. With this wind, they're going to smell us from miles away. You can't expect us to sit back without a plan. Ah, oh, whistled innocently. Not that that's what you just spent the past few weeks. Shinesbuck punched him. Not the time for mutiny, Pegasus. Captain? The guards were already splitting into small squadrons and soaring about, and the acting captain looked at her with a sigh. The princess has ordered us to defend you, but this battle may be difficult. What do you have to contribute? This unusually powerful magic sword for one, Gerardo offered, stumbling out from the stairwell and holding out the black sword. Though I'm afraid I've been on my feet far too long today to... He pitched forward and collapsed, utterly exhausted. Shinespark stared around. Harshwater, she stabbed. What's the state of my crew? Harshwater's eyes shifted. Dead, injured, exhausted, or useless. I'm the only one who knows how to fight who isn't incapacitated, and I'm not a zealot who goes blindly charging in. Shinespark gritted her teeth. Gerardo and Starlight? No. Felicity? Saffron? Anyone? I'd have you in the back line defending the ship if it comes to it. None of you are going out there tonight. I may be a good shot with certain types of firearms, darling, Felicity volunteered, but there's absolutely no way I'll be swinging a sword. An explosion sounded several hills away, along with another roar. Fine. Shinespark strapped a sword to her own side, fumbling slightly from the lack of her usual telekinesis. Fine. Were those things always that massive? One Pegasus exclaimed to another, the squadron wheeling around a valley containing a creature that might once have been imagined as a goat. It was reddish-purple and massive, big enough to take up the entire deck of the Immortal Dream, and was currently reeling from a barrel of explosives Free Pegasi had dropped to capture its attention. The ploy succeeded, and the beast lunged upward in a corkscrew motion, trying to impale the guards on its smoking horns. With expert coordination, the equestrian guards soared out of the way, not breaking formation, wheeling and carrying on to the east. Find more of them and draw them too, one bark, voice carrying over the stiff sea winds. Leaving four is leaving too many. The pickets I split, the rest of the beasts visible as shadows between the hills and the horizon. Roger! Leaving trails of unsettled yellow, half of the squadron continued to the north, two more explosive barrels carried between them. Locking targets, the Pegasus with enchanted goggles reported. We found one that's injured. Leave it to the strike team. We don't want it joining the decoy chase and falling behind. A yellow eye stared back at him, its slitted pupil thinner in the center than at the ends. Roar! The creature flung itself into a maelstrom, rearing up on its hind legs and spinning. One of its front arms was entirely missing, the stump glowing and flickering with an unearthly blue light, but it used the remaining arm like a saw blade, shredding the air with the edge of its arm and forcing the pegasite to take evasive action. Watch your flanks, the scout called from above. They can jump higher than they look. As if on cue, a third beast flung itself upward from a valley a hill away, its trajectory perfectly calculated to intercept any pegasi that were dodging upward from the first. Two were perfectly in the way, flapping frantically as they realized the monster's tactics. And then another squad of three flew in from the side, diving like lightning, ramming it hard with another barrel, and splitting and soaring as the explosion knocked it off course. With a roar, the jumping beast crashed onto the injured one in the valley. Attack now, one Pegasus hollered, and a forest of spears and javelins soared for the monster, some sticking amid the woolen coats. No, another Pegasus cried. We have to lead him away. If we pick a fight here, we'll... Bruh! A fourth abomination bounded over the horizon like a gorilla, leaping from hilltop to hilltop and walking on its knuckles, pulling back an arm as it flew for a deadly punch. We can't take three of them, a third Pegasus screamed, the first two beginning to angrily blink and recover. Fall back to the east! Retreat! The beast that had been knocked from the sky leered up at the Pegasi and dug its limbs into the ground, pulling up a giant clod of earth and grass. 
then threw it like a deadly missile to lose ground shattering mid-flight into an enormous cloud of dirt clods and boulders. It was too wide for all the pegasi to escape, and three were caught fully in the blast taken to the ground along with it. You and you, search and rescue! Save the third barrel! We have to split these three as well! Yellow streaks blazed for the sky in chaotic directions as the Pegasus formation shattered, the groups shifting as tactics changed. The newcomer beast grinned, following its companion's lead and hefting a colossal chunk of land. Suddenly, an arrow whizzed through the air, embedding itself in the clump of dirt. Half a second later, it exploded in a fiery salvo, breaking the projectile and showering the creature with earth. The Pegasi glanced around wildly. This doesn't make us friends, Gunfer grunted, flying lamely over a nearby hill with his bow drawn and a quiver of exploding arrows pulled from his ruined, bloodied suit. But between me and them, it's personal. Shinespark stepped onto the bridge, her captain's chair as vacant as it had been since the ship landed weeks ago. Don't you have a battle to fight? Jam just frowned, stepping out of the darkness. Friends to defend? All that stuff? I can't fly anymore, Shicebuck replied, voice tight and level. The only way I'll be fighting is if they come to me, and I haven't been willing to do it lately, so... If the guards are overwhelmed, and that was our last flight, I have a ship, and need to say goodbye. She slowly sat down, running a hoof over the ship's dim, pristine control console, and closed her eyes and sighed. Or you could do something useful with yourself, Jemjoz muttered. I'm still waiting on the plans for that pendant so I can try to bring Valet back. That won't work, Shinespark said, her voice quiet. If this is the end, I'll face it with dignity, but do you honestly believe there's anything we can do to make a difference? Isn't there? Jemjoz shrugged. You still have your unusually harmonic cutie mark, don't you? No. The chair didn't hide Shinespark's flank, still clearly adorned with a brand. I don't. Without my horn, it doesn't work. You really need to listen more, Jamshaw sighed. I have a friend who's been explaining harmony extensively to me. The stuff you make your ship run by. She says it's a power that can shape the world around you based on your emotions and desires. Shinespark refused to look back, the ship's meters and dials dim before her. That means nothing. If I could have saved Einridge just by wanting to, Sosa would still be standing. Don't look at me, Jemjo shrugged. But even if you lost, everyone thinks you put up a pretty good fight. Look, she trotted forward and glared up at Shinespark. I don't really care about your personal crises and how good you are at saving cities. I'm mostly interested in keeping my body in one piece. And right now, you should be doing your part toward that instead of sulking and waiting. Shinespark's eyes bored into her. And what part are you playing to save yourself? Aren't you waiting just as much as I am? Yes, Jem just shrugged. You're a hypocrite. This isn't even your ship. I'm also not the one with an unusually harmonic cutie mark, Jem just countered, rolling her eyes. You want to make yourself useful? Go use what you have. Who cares if it's not strong enough? Go hook yourself up to your Harmony Extractor and do everything you can anyway. Isn't that what your friends would do? Shinespark gritted her teeth. I told you that if we're going to die, I'm going to face my death with dignity, not clinging and scrabbling to schemes with no chance of success. Jamjar stared at her with no words necessary. Shinespark hit her head against the control panel. Even though there was no chance of success when Starlight stopped the Windigoods in Iron Ridge, but I'm not her, and don't know why she can do the things she can. She sure wouldn't have been able to if you didn't leave this ship there waiting for her, Jamjar shrugged. You can mope around if you want. I always figured you'd go down fighting. Hissing, Shinespark sucked in a breath, got up, and stomped away. Shinespark? Maple looked up as her friend entered the engine room, worry on her face. Gerardo was just here. What's going on? Shinespark just sighed. Some monsters the Equestrians were keeping sealed in their border fortress escaped, and Celestia is gone, and the guards she left are trying to protect us from them. There's a battle happening, and there's nothing any of us can do. Oh, Maple's face fell. I suppose that's... 
how it is for me when we get in a lot of battles. Trying to stand up to Chrysalis, I just got knocked to the side. I know. Shinespark sat down beside a bed, gently touching Maple's shoulder. Me too. You haven't been feeling well, Maple whispered. About... everything. Are you... If you're going to say okay, think about how likely that might be, Shinespark whispered back. But I'm better than I could be. There's just nothing else to be done. Amber appeared in the doorway, Valet's body at her side. Shinespark, I've been trying to see if Valet thinks she can fight for us and... Come... Shinespark motioned her over. That's just a husk. Either the guards will win or they won't, but if they don't, I... shouldn't be alone. The door had been left open above, shouts filtering down from the deck. One monster inbound! A guard cried in the distance. Fire! There was an explosion and a crunch. None of us are up there this time, are we? Amber asked, trotting closer and sitting with Maple and Shinespark. A valet's body joined them. No, Shinespark answered, the black sword still clasped at her side. Not this time. So we could die and there's nothing we'd be able to do about it? Amber looked up. Well, I suppose we survived Chrysalis by coincidence already. I guess these are the dangers of adventuring, huh? Her eyes watered slightly. You think it was worth it, Maple, instead of staying home in Riverfall? Don't talk like that, Maple gently reprimanded. Maybe we should have died to Chrysalis, but we didn't. Starlight saved us. You talk about her more like she's your hero than your daughter, Shinespark softly replied. She's not here this time, though. And even if she was, how many times can one pony do something like that? Suddenly, something sparked, and the lights went out. What the? Shinespark struggled, trying to force magic into her broken horn. It sparked fitfully, but still enough for the mares to see by. In the center of the room, Valet's body had somehow tugged the Moonglass sword free from its power cage before wandering it over and placing it by the group. Heh, <laughs> see? Amber patted his kindness back, nudging the sword into the center of the circle. She's still got brains. She knows Starlight and Valet would want to be here too. Starlight stared at the viewport to the outside world, ears folded back in disbelief. This has been surreal enough already, but who are we? Valet asked, staring along with her. It doesn't matter, Stolly straightened up. Our friends are in trouble, and we have to get out of here, right now. I don't care how possible it is. We've both done things that should have been impossible. Hey, Lynn! She looked back out into the pedestal room. Are you still there? Yes, Gwendolyn squeaked. Stolly, where am I? It doesn't matter, Stolly shouted back. Just stay here. I'm going to get us out, somehow. Machine, nightmare modules, tell me exactly where we are right now. Nowhere in particular, the voice replied. A blank canvas, if you will. You know how this world works, Starlight Glimmer. Drawing from the memories of the souls within it, it conforms itself to their consciousness. We are in the same place where you go to dream, only tethered there by a power you yourself created using Crystal's aid. Starlight winced at the use of her full name, right there while Valet was listening. This is merely a section of the world with no soul to paint it. It is controlled by those who have kept their memories, such as Crystal and yourself. Crystal desired a place where she might act upon her jealousy and resentment of you, and so that is what it has presently become. Who are you and why do you know this? Starlight called back. And what can I do about it? I am an interface within each of Princess Luna's creations. It is my purpose to guide and regulate administrative access between their magic and the world around them. In simpler terms, I am a machine, and I was created to know this. At the moment, you could think of me as Valet's version of the instance of me you regularly communicate with, which is restricted here. As for your second question, this area is currently being shaped by Crystal. You could change it if you could put more power behind your desires than she can. You know, however, who and what she is. Stanza, Starlight whispered. You mean the kind of power she used to drain all the cuny marks from Garshiva and every bat pony in Mistvale? Yes. Starlight looked at her hooves. But I'm just one filly. She gritted her teeth. You also don't look like someone who gives up easily. Valet patted her on the shoulder. Yo, Machine Fang! Think you can make this place play rude noises at this crystal or chrysalis or whatever to get her attention? I think it sounds like we've got a fight to pick with her. 
You're right, Stolid said, glancing back at the window to her friend, still huddled around the sword, as shouts filtered down from the deck in the distance. Nothing will stop me from trying. But... We? Yep, Valet winked. I'm super fuzzy on how this place works, but she said it does what we want if we want it harder than that other punk, right? So, if we challenge her together, think we'll be twice as effective? Stolid blinked. Hey, maybe if I really want us fighting her to look like a cool laser battle, it'll let us out of this machine so I can stretch my legs and finally Chrysalis arrived, glancing in mild annoyance up at the screen. What? I'm too busy figuring out how this place works to spend time playing with you. Let us go, Stolid threatened. Chrysalis rolled her eyes. No. Yeah, let us out, you punk! Valet made a rude gesture, but Chrysalis merely rolled her eyes and started walking back away. Starlight hissed, glancing around and wishing the nightmare module voice would return. What was she supposed to do? I told you that your odds of success would be low. The battle cries above had grown more and more desperate as seconds passed, but Maple, Amber, Shinespark, and Valet's body stayed huddled together, sitting in the engine room around Stolid's moonglass sword. Suddenly, screams sounded from above, and the ship rocked hard. That can't be good, Amber whispered, shaking. Something big is out there. Maple hugged her despite the pain in her ribs. Sorry, girls. Sorry, Willow. Sorry, Starlight. I guess the soldiers couldn't do enough. I never thought the guards would lose when I finally wanted them to win. I wish I could have seen you one more time. Amber squeezed her eyes shut. At least it will be quick, right? Or do these things take captives and... It won't be quick, but not because of that. Shinespark shook her head, a dark smile growing on her muzzle, her sparking broken horn the only source of light in the room. This ship was made with an experimental hull prototype my biological father, Mobius, spent ten years developing in an effort to make a new generation of water travel and compete with the airships. It wasn't enough for him, but there was nothing his tests could do to damage it. I wouldn't be surprised if it could survive a mile-high drop, nose first. As long as they're too big to fit inside, they can't just break through and grab us. We might starve while they wait for us to come out, but we can die on our own terms. Amber looked up. You could have mentioned that earlier. Or maybe it's not as strong as we thought it was. Shrinespark shrugged. Now that we're here, I just feel like I have more I should have... Should still, Maple corrected. We're not gone yet, right? Maybe the soldiers are doing a maneuver and with an almighty clang, the ship was lifted a foot in the air, landing slightly at an angle. Amber latched onto Shinespark and started crying. Maple's smile cracked too, and she turned to the sword. Starlight, I love you. Starlight stared frantically between Chrysalis's retreating form and a window to her friends, their voices all filtering down from above. Whether or not there was anything she could do, they had no one left to protect them. This is how it would have been without her. It was how it was without her, and it was how it was always going to be. Maple had left Riverfall because of her. If it wasn't for her, they would never have been here. But now they were, and she wasn't there to protect them. She wasn't where she needed to be. Chrysalis! Starlight screamed, trying to rush the screen again. Chrysalis looked over her shoulder and curled her lap. My friends are going to die out there, Starlight roared. I need to find a way to help them. Let me out and stand aside or help me. Don't stick me in here. You're stuck in this world whether I have you in there or not, Chrysalis drawled. Don't be a sore loser. I told you, once I find a way to make this place switch us, they won't even be your friends anymore anyway. And they're going to die, Stolly cried, her hooves finally, somehow, making physical contact with the screen window she was looking out of. Even if you do get this place to work for you, you won't even have friends waiting for you on the outside. Chrysalis sneered. A clever ploy, but I can tell a lie when I hear it. Chrysalis! Starlight's friends were waiting for her. 
They were gathered around a sword, waiting for death or salvation. They wanted to see her again, too. Maybe she couldn't do it on her own, but she swung a hoof and hit the display and felt the glass crack. Chrysalis's eyes bulged in surprise, and she frowned. With a flicker of green from where her horn should have been, the monitor repaired itself. I'm coming for you, Starlight howled, pummeling the screen again. Chrysalis sighed and sat down, repairing the damage effortlessly. How are you doing that? Are you really going to make me sit here and full-sit you? I'll never stop, Starlight warned, a vein twitching around her eyes. I'll fight you for the rest of eternity here if you cost me my friends. Bananas, girl, you're scary, Valerie remarked. Hey, meathead, do what she says or else I'll beat you up too. Give up, Chrysalis complained, tossing her limbs in exasperation. Whatever you're doing is weak, and I have things to do. Should have thought about that before becoming my enemy again, Starlight snarled, glancing around. Chrysalis was right, unfortunately. She needed more power. Valet, where's Garshiva? Valet blinked. Gar, who? Starlight pointed down at the pedestal, where red and blue cutie mark stones were inserted in two of the slots. You're tied to the red one, I think. The blue one belonged to someone called Garshiva. They're called artifices, and they're strong. If Garshiva is here and could help us? Ah, uh, I don't think so. Valet tilted her head. I definitely do have something going on with the red one. Feels almost like a rope tying us together now that you make me think about it. But I've never seen anyone else in here? Stolich's vision panned, and she searched the room for anything that would help. Lynn hiding under a side screen with perked ears, Chrysalis staring at them and daring her to try punching the screen again, the two artifices. Hadn't Garshiva's been given to her by Luna as a gift in the memory nightmare module? Maybe it wasn't attached to her soul. Maybe it was just a single brand floating there with no one to use it? Valet, she whispered. I got stuck in here after she tried shoving me in that slot. And if you feel tethered to your cutie mark, which isn't there, if it was removed, would you be free? Chrysalis scoffed. As if there's any way for you to remove them from in, Gwendolyn dashed out into the center, jumped, grabbed onto the red artifice, and yanked it free. Red light blazed around the pedestal, and Chrysalis stepped back in surprise and anger. When it finished, only the blue artifice remained, and Valet stood where the red one had been. Scowling, she rubbed her head and glared at Chrysalis. Oh, bananas, this feels weird. I've got a good feeling you're about to get a whooping. See if you can try, Chrysalis snarled back, readying her green spear. What's that whelp doing helping you? She should go back to her memories where she belongs. She flung it straight at Lynn, who screamed and covered her head. Valet effortlessly knocked the weapon off course. Maybe you should be more worried about me, Valet warned, stepping down the pedestal and towards her. Go back where you belong, Chrysalis's eyes burned. You were compassionate enough to stand up for me when we were alive. My quarrel isn't with you. Too bad, I fight for my friends. As Valet took off and Chrysalis was forced to react, Lynn stared up at the screen, Starlight stuck inside alone. If I take the other one out, will that free you too? Starlight's ears fell. I don't think so. That one was tied to Garshiva, but I think it's just on its own now. And I don't have a cutie mark. That's why I left nothing behind when she put me in. Her friends stayed constant in the background, their conversation weighing on her like an anvil. As she stared at the pedestal, a lonely realization hit her. She had always known that she would be willing to get a cutie mark if it meant saving her friends, but had never considered she might find herself in a place where she was stuck because she hadn't had one already. Unless... Starlight stared intently at the artifice. Garshiva's was based on the virtue of hope, right? She didn't know her special talent, but she was stubborn and never gave up in impossible scenarios. It couldn't be that poor of a match. When it was a mark without a pony and she was a pony without a cutie mark? 
and it was an artifice to boot, designed to mirror an intensely harmonic artifact. Stolly swallowed. If there was any way it could help her help her friends... Her nightmare module voice rose beside her. It is as you will it. With a soft flare of blue light, the nebulous spots on Stolich's flanks resolved, becoming the triangles she had once seen on the Nightmother with far less fanfare than she had expected. A faint sensation of a chord like Valet had talked about tugged on her mind, but otherwise she felt utterly unchanged. For all her worries months ago about getting a cutie mark, here she was with one that wasn't even hers and it hadn't done a thing to her. If it weren't for the tension, she could almost have sighed in relief. Lynn, Stolich called. It's different now. Pull the blue one free. Not so fast, Chrysalis hissed, soaring over as Valet was slammed against the wall by a field of telekinesis that covered the entire breadth of the room, leaving her nowhere to dodge. Her forehoof slammed down on Lynn before she could reach for the pedestal again, crushing the filly against the floor. I'm not falling for that again. Stop fighting me and hold still. Starlight stared intently down from her perch in the central screen. Never. The boat rocked and clunked again, tossed a foot or more in the air. Maple cried out from the jostling to her wounded ribcage, and Hamber and Scheinspark fought to keep their balance. On the surface, two of the brood had reached the ship and were largely ignoring the pegasi swarming around them as they investigated their catch. Sniffing and nudging it, they stood taller than it was when they reared fully up and one was on the deck poking around. The other shoulder-checked it experimentally. Grrrr! Sir, none of our attacks are working, a frantic pegasus reported. They're too large and we're out of explosives. They're not even interested in us. Tell me something I don't know, Private, the captain growled, loading a crossbow and firing it at one creature's eye. It turned its head and blocked the shot effortlessly with a massive horn. We must trust the diversion team and do our part regardless. With a roar, a furred beast bounded over the horizon, this one very much interested in chasing Pegasi. There's a furred, several guards screamed, adjusting formation and focusing fire on the newcomer. The battle continued to rage, with jam jars hunkered on the bridge, unable to get below if she wanted to. Hairy arms pounded the deck like it was a drum, and horns rammed aside, rolling the boat and trying to tip it over. This can't happen, Glimmer whispered from the landing outside the engine room. Shinespark's ears snapped up. Well, it's happening, whether you like it or not. Glimmer turned and stepped inside the room. You don't understand. It mustn't. Nobody had an answer for her, all still huddled by the sword. Listen to you all, Glimmer said. When you need someone to save you, you put all your faith in Starlight and she knows it. I was supposed to prevent her from growing up with that kind of a burden on her shoulders, but how can she ignore the cries of her best friends? But now I've failed. You're going to die, and when she someday escapes from that obsidian, she's going to have nobody waiting for her. That will end her. What do you want us to do about it, Amber? Choked high, streaming. Shut up! Up until minutes ago, I thought we were going to be safe with Princess Celestia, and she just left because of your dragon! You're right that it shouldn't be on Starlight to fix just because she's usually able. It should be on you! Amber is right. Shinesper got up, her horn sparking painfully to keep the lights on. I was there. Do you really intend to lecture us about who we want to spend our last minutes thinking of when it's your fault they're our last in the first place? We know nothing about who you are or even what your name is. You showed up one day and saved Valet and that's why we let you travel with us, but you've never made friends with us and always done your own thing, and now we get to find out you had something you didn't tell us about that caused the Princess of the Plains of Harmony to abandon us at the worst possible time. Maple just sniffed. You owe us an explanation, Schoensberg demanded. If you're going to treat us like this right when our chance has been snatched out from under us by something you brought here, we deserve to know. She flung a hoof at Glimmer. Who are you, and what was your machine, and why was it worth Celestia leaving us right before this happened? Glimmer closed her eyes. I... I'm sorry. I know you want an explanation, but I don't owe you that. I owe you your lives. Maple blinked. That would be welcome too, but what? Glimmer picked up one of the empty helmets for the Harmony Extractor. 
All three mares reacted at once, Maple reaching a hoof with wide eyes. What are you? No, don't! No! Starlet needs friends, Glimmer said, placing the bowl on her head. Take good care of her for me. More depends on it than you think. An unearthly hum rolled through the immortal dream, one it had only traversed once before. Every light in the ship reignited, blazing blue, and the two beasts that were currently assaulting it looked up, glancing at each other in confusion. What the? The guards flocking around the ship looked up from the third beast as well. That doesn't look good, the captain warned. Stay back and take cover. A pool of brightness blazed, visible through the hull from the engine room. With crackles of lightning, energy arced all across the hull, sparking where the wooden coating was damaged and making the beasts wince in pain. What's going on? More Pegasi cried, the air where the Harmony Comet had once been shimmering and distorting. With a conical explosion of blue, the comet reformed, instantly decapitating the head and upper body of the beast standing on the deck. It roared at its constraints with the force of a hurricane, a single shot overload of energy, waiting for direction from the one who commanded it. Jam jars, Glimmer cried, reduced to a fading specter in the engine room beneath a storm of harmony raging above. The helmet was destroyed, the equipment faring little better than when Starlight had done the same, blue fire pouring from exploded meters and dials and reflecting in Shinespark's stupefied eyes. She's on the bridge! Someone use the intercom! On the bridge, Jamjars had gotten her hooves beneath her, the ship console alive with unearthly energy. She had heard the stories. She had been in Iron Ridge. But this burst of harmony was destined for something far different than exploding windigos. With a trademark, shark-like grin on her face, she punched the dashboard, pushing the ship's acceleration all the way forward. One moment the ship was there. The next, he was gone, a fading afterimage in the guard's eyes and a furrow carved in the ground in the direction it had been facing. Shinespark's hull melted through hills without resistance, the ship flying forward through the ground at miles per second. Its nose was angled down, but the ground gave way without resistance, blown away by the sheer power of the ship's construction and the jolt of harmony carving a wide trench and annihilating Celestia's railroad as it barreled toward the sea. Everyone on it was buoyed by blue, cushions of energy extending from the comet and fighting inertia so that the crew wouldn't be reduced to just as much paste as the hells. Finally, they burst from a bank and plowed into the water, the ship landing in the sea with colossal force. Starlight! Maple screamed in the engine room, somehow on her hooves. What are you doing? Don't do this again to me! I'm not your starlight, Glimmer apologized, already growing faint, the cloud of blue beginning to dissipate overhead. She'll be safe if you keep her safe. I'm sorry. Good Maple charged through her, and her cutie mark flashed, doing once again what she had used it for an Anridge. Glimmer was gone. Gasping, Amber struggled to her hooves. What? Shinespark's eyes flickered between the ruined engine room, the dregs of Glimmer's Harmony Cloud, and the obsidian sword, which was looking slightly melted from the explosion. Grabbing it in her teeth, she flung it up into the energy still coursing through the rails. Leave me alone to pursue my goal in peace, Chrysalis hissed. Stop fighting and stay put! No! Starlight continued struggling to break the screen, and Chrysalis actually had to spend effort stopping her this time. I would have helped you. I would have let you come and be friends with my friends if you would have just been nicer and trusted me. But I'm never going to stop as long as you keep doing this to me and my friends. Suddenly, the ceiling crackled with force. Hmm? Chrysalis glanced up and gasped, barely jumping out of the way in time to avoid incineration by a continuous lightning bolt of blue that struck the pedestal, causing every screen in the room to blaze with light. She cried out in pain, her fetlock singed where she had been slightly too slow. Starlight's eyes reflected the energy, and the cutie mark she had a new attachment to no longer felt so normal. It was overloaded with everything she had been missing since falling into this place, or everything since using the nightmare modules against Chrysalis, or maybe even further back. But it was a wellspring of power, 
and she grabbed onto it, attacking the screen with everything she had. There was no way Chrysalis could stop her. Starlet exploded out into the room, gently gliding to the ground, feeling even more overloaded than when the Trees of Harmony were lending her their power. Her horn pulsed right on her forehead where it belonged, and she seized Lynn and Valet, dragging them over to her in front of the pedestal. I would have helped you, Starlet warned, pointing a hovet chrysalis and hovering in place, pointedly aware of where this burst of energy had come from. I would have, but it's too late for that now, chrysalis. Maybe someday I'll be back for you and try again, but I'm not staying here any longer. You hear me, world? Let. Us. Out! She flew for the ceiling, Lynn and Valet held with her, the feeling of wings working at her size, even though she was a unicorn again. Her horn blazed with borrowed power, and she slashed at the ceiling, pouring herself into the desire to be free and save her friends. Even Glimmer believed in her at last. This was a gift to help her escape. The ceiling cracked, stars visible beyond. Chrysalis tried to lunge, but an invisible wall of force blocked her way, and Starlight dragged her friends up and into the chaos, leaving the world behind. The sword landed on the floor of the engine room, pointed to the sky, balanced perfectly on its half-melted handle. It shimmered and glowed, the reflections in its facets distorting with sparkles of stars and then it exploded, its tip shattering into several shards. The ground beneath it melted into a circle, absorbing the last of the light from the extractor rails, and a faint outline of a filly rose up, landing in front of the sword. Her cutie mark pulsed, and she grew slightly more corporeal. Starlight! Maple gasped, staggered against the wall of the room. Amber gaped as well, and Shinespark reluctantly smiled. Starlight flailed, realizing her hoofs passed straight for the floor, but a new artifice mark flickered again, and she faded slightly further into existence. I'm fine, she insisted. Valet! Lynn! Where? She glanced at the two shards that had broken off from the sword tip. Farron Veith, she knew, her horn glowing and lighting the engine room. A sinking feeling filled her as she realized just how far her friends still were from the living world. This one is Valet, and this one is Lynn. Varen here. Amber stared at the shards with wide eyes and took off the lace beret, pulling out a golden pendant and offering it to Shinespark. Shinespark blinked between them with stupefied disbelief and a slow, shocked smile. I'm going to need a screwdriver. What was that? The Pegasi struggled to regroup in the aftermath of the ship's departure. One beast had keeled over dead, and the other two took off, bounding toward the sea in pursuit of the quarry that had suddenly killed one of their own. Irrelevant! Protect the ship! The captain flourished a trident in one hoof and a spear in the other. Formation ponies! Don't let the beast catch up first! They streaked over the water after following the ship's furrow, several bisected rivers already draining into the unnaturally straight trench. The beasts were faster on land, but over water? The Pegasi had the advantage. Both beasts growled threateningly as they were passed, the immortal dream floating damaged in the bay. Assemble! They're going to try to capsize the boat! The Pegasi swarmed again, reduced to less than half their original numbers by the fight, but too well trained to give in. One beast leapt from the water as they hovered above the deck, landing on it and beating his chest with a roar. Aim! Fire! Crossbolts streaked through the air, hammering against the first monstrosity. The second one dove from the water like a fish, its brother catching it and hurling it into the sky like a barn-sized missile. Pegasi shrieked and dove to avoid it. I've never seen them do that, one panicked. Are they learning, or do they know how to keep tricks up their sleeves? Rally and defend the boat, the captain countered. We're our charger's last line of defense. Princess Celestia herself tasked us with this. Don't be scattered. Black hooves pounded against the staircase. Boar! The beast still on the deck leaned over and grabbed the starboard railing, snapping it off like a bar of candy. It reared up, holding the railing like a jagged sword, and began slicing for the air. 
Juan Pegasus's wings were struck, and he plummeted with a scream. Don't let it use that as a weapon! Rally! Attack its head! A bolt of green skidded out from the door, sliding straight between the beast's feet with slashes of monochrome black. Ha! Ha! Take that! The beast winced, suddenly standing straighter. Who? The guards looked down in confusion. A massive head rose from the waves, and the second beast grappled the edge, rolling the boat in the water as it tried to climb aboard. The far side of the deck rose with emotion, and a green and black blur used it to launch herself into the air, landing on the first beast's back between the shoulders. Four hoofs planted themselves squarely against its hairy hide, as a black metal sword stabbed deep into its spine, and the mare let herself slip, carving all the way from its neck to its waist as she slid down. At the end of the slide, the beast toppled, and she catapulted off, flying straight for the head of the one that was climbing aboard. Grrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr